Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to RPT season number eight. I believe so. <laughs> Episode number. I think 104. I have no freaking clue. Uh, we just finished an amazing Zoom call. I, I can't wait to set that up and, and for you guys to tune in. Uh, but I am your host, Chingo Bling. We have producer Rob in the building. Buenos dias. Or afternoon. Yes. Sas. Come on. Come on, Rob. It's afternoon, brother. You're right. I got pre-workout in this bitch right here. Come on All now. Right? Come on now. Let's, let's go. go. Vamos Brandon. Vamos Brandon. Vamos Brandon. Uh, Ted Cruz just retweeted uh, my song. That is fucking cool. That's pretty fucking cool. Even though a lot of people think he's, a, I don't know, insurrectionist or something. You know, they think we're all crazy just because we're pro-freedom. We're against mandates. We don't think jabbing little kids is a good idea. You know, call me crazy. Uh, but big shout out to everyone in Houston that came out to the shows despite there being a Canelo fight. In and a UFC pay-per-view. UFC pay-per-view. There was a lot going on despite the fact that I'm shadow banned. Um, the shows were packed amazing crowds even sunday man michael berry came out to the sunday show um they did a write-up about me houstonia magazine they were like yeah political commentary is cool but empathy is more important or something let's like talk that. about that on chingo chats for sure yeah man i don't know type of goofy ass it's like people going to my shows now taking notes and then they type it up and they're typing out the punchline i'm starting to feel like Chappelle. dude you made it you am starting to feel like Chappelle. I mean, you already made it before but now you're like you are on another stratosphere of the tim dillons and Chappelle's, where people are going to your shows to take notes to take notes and also take it out of context and then write really really bad uh, and I mean, not interviews, what do you call them? Op-eds, I guess. Yeah, they didn't ask for a quote. And then, uh, not saying that I would have given one. Yeah. But um, the people aren't even going to read, let's be real. But yeah. Ten people know, are going to read it. You know, anyway, uh, it's interesting to have reporters now at your shows taking notes and things like that. Um, a lot going on in the world. But today, we're going to focus specifically on a new documentary called Cartelville. Cartelville, USA. Yeah. Cartelville, USA. Basically, um, we have Mr. Eric aka Duvalin Papi 2.0 he's on the show he saw some things firsthand he was out there with uh with Jorge, Jorge, Ventura. With yeah. Jorge Ventura documenting so it's very interesting what's going on when people think like the border situation is simply like do we need more immigrants or do we not mm -hmm. they don't factor in how the cartels their tentacles are literally across the border they're posted up in a town near you they're operating they're making money they're victimizing people they're using slave labor they're shipping the money back to the cartels in mexico all the while the fabric of our society is at risk because this is in your community under your nose and once that gets so entrenched depending on what kind of leadership you have at the time yeah. that's going to be a really messy situation to clean up and fix it, by the time it's too late. So uh, what'd you think, man? What'd you think? I saw it last night. Like I said, you're still going to watch it. You just, you've been busy, but you'll watch it later this week. I thought it was crazy because we've been talking about this on the podcast for a year now, like since we started Red Pill Tamales. And it's not like it's a new thing. It's been going on forever. Like talking cartels. About the border? Okay. Yeah, the borders, cartels, drugs, going back and forth. You know, we've been talking about the fentanyl come from China to Mexico, from Mexico to here, all this kind of stuff. But we never really talk about what's going on in places like California. Like we talk about what's going on in Texas and our border, but you can't do what they're doing in California and Texas. It's completely different. Like you can't get around, you can't skirt around laws, you know, that are federally saying you can't do this, you're going to go to prison or whatever. But in California, you get a slap on the wrist for a lot of this stuff. So they documented this, you know, this journey with these people and these slave laborers and, you know, these cartel groups. And it's crazy. It's only 34-ish minutes. So I highly recommend it. It's two ninety nine. dollars or you can get it with a free trial of Daily Caller at, um, it'll, it'll be in the description, but I believe it was carteldoc.com or cartel.doc.com. I'll have it in the description again. Mm -hmm. Watch it, please. It was really good. And I mean, I, I kind of just like, I was in awe of a lot of the shit that they covered in 34 minutes. Like the people that work for LA County or the LA politicians that are basically just letting things happen. Um, follow the money, right? Follow the bags, we always say. And if you follow the bag, you, you got a lot of people that are controlled opposition in a sense that are just ruining other citizens lives in those areas who tried to get away from all that shit in in the belly of the beast oh, man. they left it to go to a rural area where they could live and a lot of them said this almost as if they planned it but i, I doubt that they did they're like we wanted to escape the rat race we wanted to escape the homeless people we wanted to escape all the noise and nonsense the crime all the crime and now we are fearing for our lives here in our rural desert area because no one's doing anything about this well it was a very eye-opening conversation for me because as involved as I am, and as as much information as I consume, right? Yeah. I'm on Twitter, I'm looking at this, I'm trying to see what the hell's going on, right? I didn't know 
that these big illegal you know weed grows going on like in these rural areas i didn't really know that was all cartel i, I just thought it was like somebody from cali's like hey man i'm gonna go find me a little spot in the woods grow me a couple little plants have me some little weed and i can slang a little bit make some little extra money almost how like the liquor bootleggers mm-hmm. you know the kennedys and everybody like oh well there's prohibition but i'm gonna move this bourbon from here to there and i'm gonna drive really fast and I make some money and hopefully send my kids to college over here it's like no these are transnational <laughs> criminal organizations they're exploiting people they're using slave labor and, and it, it's alarming straight up car, uh, cartel well straight up uh, ozark cartel style you made that point which is really true and at least in the show I mean, it's all operating out of the country, and they just have like you know the people's farm, like the people that own the farm are doing the shit here. But in the in the in rural life, you've got people coming over using you know these immigrant slave laborers doing things on U.S. soil, right? It's just really yeah, crazy really, that that's real. That much slave labor is like, damn! I thought this was Nike making LeBrons in China. Yeah, it's like no, we got slave labor right here under our nose. Yeah, so. I hope we set it up properly for you guys. Uh, Big props to Eric, uh, photographer. um, Videographer. He was even out there on the border, Mm -hmm. you know, capturing images, seeing like abandoned kids traveling alone. Um, There's a lot going on, ladies and gentlemen, in America. Wake up, maybe share it with your normie friends. Uh, Anytime the border debate comes up, this border debate is transforming on the daily basis. Like, there's more repercussions. Trust me, this is coming from Mr. They Can't Deport Us All. I was all in. Ah, you can't tell me. Ah, whatever, whatever. Like, I wasn't trying to hear a lot of these arguments. But what's happening now, how can you present this to people and them not be like, man, you got a point. <laughs> I don't know about having cartel all up in my neighborhood. Yeah. And they, I think someone said... I don't know if they said in the documentary, but like, before you know it, there's going to be a, a body being hung from an overpass yep. with, a, with a sign the way it is in Mexico. Yep. Dude, it's crazy. I know we're talking about some heavy stuff, but don't forget, yeah. the day after this drops, you'll be in Vegas. That's right. First time, right? First time doing stand-up comedy yes. in Las Vegas. Um, I, dude, I used to go out there uh, back back in the day, even in the beginning of my career. So it's very cool to... Um, Go back out, this time doing stand-up. Got a lot of friends and stuff out there. And uh, it's going to be a packed house at Wise Guys Comedy Club, November 11th. Do not get sold out. Get your tickets now at chingobling.com. And then after that, it's just Salt Lake City, November 18th. And also Wise Guys Comedy Club. Then after that, man, we just double down on the podcasting. Uh, we're looking for some tour sponsors for next year. There's no reason why I shouldn't have had a tour sponsor for my tour. Uh, we're going to, you know, we want like a really good sponsor for the podcast. Um... I don't want to be traveling as much. The way things are looking, I won't be able to enter New York State pretty soon. I won't be able to enter California pretty soon. Uh, Texas might just be our little country. Texas and Florida. I might visit the country of Florida. (laughs) Um, I don't know if it's going to be just straight metaverse for Chingo from now on. And we have uh, our goal of 1,000 patrons that we want to try to hit by the end of the year to upgrade studio equipment, get some other uh, virtual help as far as like editors. editors. Yeah, video editors, man. We got content we're trying to crank out. Yeah, so with your help, we can do all that. It takes an army. It does. It takes a village. Patreon.com forward slash slash. red pill tamales. So without further ado, we're going to get into the Zoom call with Eric, a.k.a. Duvalin Papi 2.0. Sass. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest right now via satellite from an undisclosed location. Uh, everybody welcome, man. Eric, a.k.a. at Duvalin Papi 2.0 with the backup page. And uh, if you know, you know why he had to get the backup page. Shout out to Jorge Ventura. Uh, he's the one that put us on your radar and your work. Can you tell us a little bit first uh, about the kind of work that you do? Well, I'm a photojournalist here in Southern California. Uh, before I started doing the stuff here with Jorge and the other boys on the border, I was, uh, just going around Southern California, documenting what was happening with the Mexican American and Latino community throughout the height of the pandemic. Uh, just noticing that some people were like, mainly with like the low rider meetups and like the underground parties, like that's what I was trying to document. Cause you know, at that time, everyone was supposed to be quarantined. Don't go out. If you know, if you don't have to see close ones, don't see them. But you know, as Latinos, a lot of for us, you know, a lot of stuff just kind of like, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> We're gonna still do our own thing over here. So that was kind of my beginnings as to like how I got into photojournalism, just documenting what was happening with my raza, how they were handling things, uh, despite people going out of business, losing work, uh, 
the deaths and all that. Um, and then after that, in March, I, I'm i pretty sure you guys are familiar with Anthony Calasa, mm-hmm. informed with Anthony. Mm-hmm. I went out to the border with him in McAllen in March to document the border crisis. And then that's how I met Jorge, uh, Julio Rosa, James Clue, Jorge Blue, Ventura. Um, some other boys. That, yeah, that's how I met Jorge Ventura out there. So, so okay, so just to kind of recap... So before the pandemic, you were just a, a photographer, not really like photojournalist, if you will, or? At the pandemic, that's when I kind of started. That's when I you got st- my press pass to, during the pandemic. And uh, then like the next year was when the whole border crisis started to pick up speed again. So I was just like, you know what? Anthony is asking me to go out there with them. I already met him a few times before that. So I just went out there and then. What you saw is what we what you guys saw. You know what I mean? Just people by the thousands coming over um, day and night, all hours of the day, all mm-hmm. hours of the night. Women, uh, kids, found, yeah. Yeah, but especially that's the thing for me, man, the, just coming across abandoned children, you know? Like, I've never seen anything like that in my life. So, like, that's still, I think about that stuff every day. Just, like, walking around, and then there's just kids with no one. Terrifying, man. So the documentary, what is the name of the documentary that just released? The documentary is called Cartelville USA. And if you guys want to watch it, you can go to carteldoc.com. Uh, I, have you seen it? I did, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> it, it just came out. I haven't had a chance. Yeah, Chingo's uh, super busy, you know, the tour and all. But yeah, dude, I saw it um, last night or yesterday. And it's, you know, it's 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 easy to digest it's like 34 minutes right it's about a little over half an hour long it's got all the info about uh what is it uh, southern what, what part of california is that uh that's in the high in the antelope valley so like just like 30 to 40 minutes outside of palmdale um out in those desert communities uh putting like neighboring uh san bernardino okay yeah i'm super n- valley and not familiar stuff. with that you know with california at all but it was really good because you guys were you you know boots on the ground you guys were going out there and exploring these desert areas um how did y'all get so much access to what was going on over there uh well fortunately that's uh Jorge's, that's his hood out there so uh no exaggeration the last time i was out on the border when I, we're not on the border, but in Texas for an event. When I came back, I wasn't even, I was home for like four days. And he calls me. He's just like, hey, man, you got to get over here because you want to be part of this because it's like the cartel are taking over Palmdale and like the desert area. And I was just like, wait a minute, what? And this the is cartels on, are, are, on the American Palmdale? side. Like, I had no clue. Yeah, on the American. I had no clue this was happening. And he told me, like, I didn't know either until um, Rep, uh, Representative Mark Garcia who was out there at the border, who saw the stuff that was happening, who uh, represents that district, where Jorge is at, told him about it. So, like, it was just completely new to me. This just the kind of stuff that, you know, you see, like, on TV or movies and stuff like that. So to finally get that close to what was happening, it was uh, pretty intense. It was scary. Um, how, how would you set it up for, for Chinga, who hasn't seen it, and all the listeners? Like, hopefully all the Red Pelt Mala listeners go watch the documentary. But how would you set up, like, what you guys were looking to do and how you what, what you found and what you came away with? So what we were looking to do was just uh, find people that live out there uh, to talk with us about that situation going on with the cartels. And um, there were some people that were brave enough to, I mean, the, the identities were concealed for their own safety. But it was, it was needed for people to speak out about what's happening. Because um, it's like in Mexico, people don't, they don't want to talk about that because they know that they can face retaliation, kidnappings, death, you know, all that stuff. So that's, that's why Mexico is the way it is. You know, I mean, that's, that's the motherland for me. I'm first generation American and I love Mexico to death. But you have to also accept the fact that Mexico has these problems where no one wants to talk. Mm-hmm. And... If we don't start doing that here, now that these guys are like taking taking ground wherever they can get it, same thing's gonna happen here. No one's gonna want to talk. They're just gonna keep taking more land, stealing land, stealing people's property, stealing people's water, you know, whatever it may be. They're gonna they're gonna just use that silence to their advantage. Yeah, and then once you sprinkle in corruption, open borders, absolutely, uh, uh, weird policies, and defund the police on top of all that. Um, I think we might have said that on the show before in, in the <clears throat> episodes back where we're like, God forbid. It's all bundled up. Yeah. Yeah. God forbid that, that we continue down this path, uh, you know, with the propaganda, the media. I think more so during like the height of BLM and 
Antifa and everyone just this idea that, you know what, police are all bad, you know, just because it's one cop in Minneapolis. Now we need to just abolish ICE and get rid of this and open the border. And, and it's like, whoa, 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 hang on now. Because the last thing we want is for America to turn into Mexico in terms of, right, because I love Mexico también. Uh, you know, that's the motherland. But people are being terrorized. People are being victimized. Like people are literally the same way you have Central Americans saying, hey, man, this shit's very dangerous for me and my kids and my family. We need to bounce. There's a lot of people in different parts of Mexico that are like, I can't have a business here. They're mm -hmm. taxing us to death. They're extorting people. Uh, there's curfews. And then the police can't back you up because they're in cahoots. The right. government can't back you up because they're partners with them. <laughs> Dude, it's fucked up. And then you have, you know, uh, uh, Joseph Raheem Breezy, a.k.a. Build Back Better Biden. <laughs> he he wants the border wide open. He wants a, this dysfunctional border. We have all this fentanyl coming in, all this sex trafficking, and all that is doing is putting more millions and millions of dollars in these, uh, you know, transnational uh, crime organizations. Build Back Better Brandon. No, pues está cabrón. Hey, Eric, so Chingo made a good point <laughs> about all of the uh, all the bad policies. What were, because again, encourage everybody to go watch it. It's $2.99, by the way. So let's tell listeners it's $2.99 to get unlimited access to it. You own it, basically. You can watch it anytime, or you can uh, get a free trial to Daily Caller and you can access it for free. So you get a free 30 right. day trial, right? So that there's the plug for that. Go listen to it or go watch it, you know, for free or pay three bucks. It's totally worth it. So as far as the policy, what was some of the craziest things that you, witnessed you know shooting the video in the in the photos that california is doing to kind of almost not prevent this from stopping right now uh to the policies i guess they're preventing it's just uh it's just like california politics man like it's just stereotypically just you know like they uh it's a prop 64 mm -hmm. which you know back i think it was 2016 where you know they made weed uh recreational in california california was the only state that brought down illegal cultivation from a felony to a misdemeanor. It was the only state. So you can you can have like a a marijuana grow that's like fifty thousand plants. A hundred. You can have like a basically like an Amazon looking facility for weed, and that's a misdemeanor. It's like a five hundred dollar fine. You maybe you're probably released same day or the next day, and then you're just back at it. You know what I mean? So like one of these plants can sell for like. 1500 to 2000 and if you have thousands and thousands of them you're like well i'll just sell this one plant and i'm going to go back making my money you know like making a lot of money too just because of how these operations are so blatant so obvious it's like going out on a walk and seeing like a, a monument or something like that that you're always familiar with you know like people just walk by them drive by them um how, how does the police, that police uh -huh. The like the sheriff out there, they, they're like so under equipped and unmanned. They don't have the resources, so they're like ninety minutes, up to ninety minutes for anyone to show up. So by the time they get tipped off, and they're on the way, since the cartel just you know they they own all that area, so like they'll know before anyone even gets there. So they're like, hey, ya viene la, ya viene las juras, you know? So okay, let's just get out of here. They got all the time in the world to just. You know, finish eating their food, the tacos or whatever, and then they just bounce. So, so the they issue... just leave the people that work there that they have as slaves, basically. You mm. know, the, that's the thing about how we, see, we were saying that this is all you know bundled up. The people that come up from the border, that I'm sure you saw the bracelets too that they put on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got these. You know, this is this is a sign of human trafficking right here. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't just cross into Texas or Arizona and then that ya se acabó. You know what I mean? If you owe money, you're like, okay, ya te cruzamos, ahora chingarle. We're going to send you over here and you're going to grow weed. You're going to be trafficked into, you know, put into the sex trade. If you're a girl, a young girl, um, whatever it may be, whatever they want you to do, if you owe them money for being crossed over, that's what you got to do to pay it off. And some of these people are out there for like six months to a year. So that was crazy for me seeing that. There's probably people that we saw with our own eyes in Texas that got sent all the way to the the Acton Valley and they got to work off this debt out in like 110 degrees Palmdale if you're in the greenhouses it's like 120 probably because of humidity and you get no say you can't say what you want to do or nothing you just they live in these shacks I'm not kidding you man it's, it's, it's depressing I said we saw how they were living these like homes that are just like falling apart 
plywood shacks. They buy RVs and they just like put 20 people inside one RV and just like one bathroom for them to share. So they sleep in these like shitty, you know, inhumane like conditions. You wake up, you walk over to the grow, you work up to 16 hours and you go right back into the shed. See, this, this you is, can't go to 7 yeah. Eleven, you can't go to Walmart. It's, that's your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shed, go work. Shed, go work. Uh, as a fan of marijuana, yeah. when I first would hear, <laughs> like, that's why that's why these laws need to be reframed and explained to people the way you just broke it down. Because if somebody told me, like, hey, man, you're allowed to grow weed and, you know, nothing really happens and it's recreational, all that kind of sounds okay to me. Because it's kind of like, oh, this shit's been criminalized forever and, you know, there's other things we need to be worried about, da, da, da. However... Once you look into the deeper side of it, it's like, no, 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 no. You're empowering cartel. You know what I mean? They're exacerbating this open border situation, these policies. It's almost like Brandon is helping the cartel. He's building back the cartel better. And then you have these uh, China human slave type of situations. You know, they're not making LeBron James sneakers, but they're over here breaking up weed and growing and and doing all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's very unfortunate. People don't, they don't see the trail and the chain of the repercussions of like, oh, it looks like there's some Haitians under the bridge or there's a couple babies crying on the border. It's like, no, 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 no. Human trafficking means human slavery, sex trade. You got mm-hmm. brothels. You got all this crazy shit going on and uh, people are being victimized. So a lot of people who voted, you know, in, in favor for uh, Biden and the Brandon administration, they, they weren't able to do their due diligence. You know what I mean? Like, it was never broken down like this to them in terms of, I mean, even myself, brother. Myself, I was Mr. They Can't Deport Us All. My identity was always like, you know, I'm son of immigrants. And they're always scapegoating us. The media is always making us yeah. look bad. They're trying to blame everything on us. So, you know what? Fuck that. We're going to buck the system. And, uh, you know, I'm going to make this slogan. They can't deport us all. Like, stop blaming us for everything. We're not all bad people. However, an open border leads to the the wristbands, the cartels making millions a day, and then who loses? Our communities, the girls, the kids. Yeah, and before you even get to like the federal policies of all this, and you just kind of dive into the documentary that they made, like the California policies alone are what's really fucking up these people. Like when you talk about the real estate, Eric, I don't know if you could expand on this, but some of this land is is outright being bought by the cartel legally, and others just, oh, just yeah. kind of being squatted on, just taken. So they're like... So it's like the desert communities out there, you know, the further inland you go in California or pretty much anywhere, like generally like the real estate is a little bit more, um, a little cheaper. So like, say you got a family and you know, you ain't trying to live in downtown LA or anything like that. You're like, you know what? I want a more tight knit community. I want to know my neighbors. I just want to have a safer environment for, for my family. People would move out there and that's what they got out there. You know, they got a good price home, good community good schools um roughly like an hour maybe away from it so you're still in la county but then these guys when they started to come in say your house is worth like 200 200 these guys will come up or they're still like an aid a real estate agent that's working with them you know because the cartel have that money you know so they're like man these guys have money well this is just going to make me money they'll go up to even if your home isn't for sale they'll just send someone over and say like so we noticed that your house is you know, we want to buy it, and if it's worth two hundred, we'll give you four hundred cash. But we want you out by the first of next month. Mm. So mm. for a lot of people, well, you know, from a money point of Hell view, yeah. like, why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, of course. Shit, I just came up. I just two times the, my investment on the house. I'm out of here. I'm gonna get something. Move on to something bigger. Well, especially if you're did, starting to people, see that there's like you know danger in the area, they're gonna be like, "Well, fuck you! I want to get out of here anyway." Yeah, that's what I was just to get, about to get to is that like the people that have tried to stay there and, and kind of fight this, um, they're not able to fight it. You know what I mean? They're like, you're up against like a cartel that's like basically militarized. They got anything that, that can rival like a, uh, any law enforcement. You know what I mean? Uh, vehicles, body armor, automatic weapons, you know, the whole thing. Um, so when they started noticing that, you know, we're getting surrounded by these guys, let's just take the money and get out of here. That's our best bet. So yeah. we met people that were living there. And now, and now uh, the last time we spoke to them, they said, you know what, we're out. We can't do this. anymore. This is no point in us staying here. We didn't want to leave, but it's just so bad now that 
it's just a risk leaving our house. So we're just going to take this money and just get out of California. I wonder what, as they become more, as the um, those organizations become more entrenched and they, the, the roots, you know what I mean? Like as they start to kind of grow and, and get more sophisticated, how they operate in the shadows underground. I wonder what is it going to take, number one, for the American people to realize that this is even happening, right? Number one. Number two, what is it going to take for either local or federal governments to be like, can you imagine? He just said they're super militarized. They're organized. They have a whole system and they're making a ton of cash. What type of operation? What type of Navy SEAL operation? You know what I'm saying? Well, like, shit, California prosecutors, uh, that was also in the documentary. He's basically, he's just, there's a slap on the wrist, right? They don't even really prosecute these people. Slap on the wrist. $500 fine. Yeah, and on top of that, the city or whoever was in charge of the water is literally selling them the water that they're siphoning out of these areas where later, or, or I don't know how far into the future, they're fearing they won't even have any water for their communities. Mm, they're using it. Oh, yeah, the they're selling them the water, and like the water board is just like, well, we're making money. Yeah, that's what that was so a response. We, we're not know, the police. That was one of the things, but what was crazy is like seeing the water theft. Like if they're not buying the water, they'll, they'll send a guy, I guess whose duty is to just go and get water. And yeah. Water trucks, fake tankers, they'll go to a fire hydrant. Trucks. Yep, they'll All bust right. open the fire hydrant, fill up these uh the trucks and the water totes. Or, I'm not kidding you. I saw this. You know how like in the uh, the Road Runner and Coyote cartoons, the Coyote would have the the dynamite <laughs> and the fuse would be like three miles long. We we saw a guy's he had like a 40 acre uh, ranch, and he showed us one of the hoses that the cartel they just did that. It was like a two mile long hose running through his whole property, up the hills, through trees, through bushes. And you just watch this thing cut to cut through his property because they just, they go on your property. If you have a well, they'll tap into your well. Wow. Like straight up, they're just going to go, this guy has like four water wells, whatever. It's just going to go to his water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sounding like and Mexico. The police tell them, like, if you see these guys doing that, just don't engage. Yeah, it, 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 sound, it sounds like, it's sounding like Mexico. <laughs> right? That's Where? what I mean. Man. It's just like the police in Mexico, they don't want to, they don't even fuck with the cartel because they know they can't do anything. In most cases, they're going to lose. Or a so lot of, like yeah. we're starting to see the beginnings of that here. Hmm. Were you in the Were you in the car when uh, you guys ran in, or when Jorge ran into those people at that abandoned, or what he thought was an abandoned house? Uh, no, that was uh, I was there, but uh, that was uh, in that house where the forty people came out. Uh, they're interviewed in the documentary. It's this couple that likes to go hiking out there. That's what it was. That yeah. was the encounter they had over there. Yeah. So in that house, again, man, like, we went into this house and it's just, it's disgusting, man. Like I can't imagine 40 people being forced to live in. Oh, there. looked out of it. Like a house like, out of the hills have eyes. Like one of the houses I played during that trailer. Yeah. They're like these homes out in the middle of the desert, just falling apart, you know, dilapidating. Uh, they guard, like you see the food that they're given <clears throat> and it's just it's junk food. You know, like pura soda, ice cream, potato. They're not really given even real food if they're, you know, to be laboring mm. you know, for that long in the day. They're just given like cheap ass food and, and water and soda. It's almost like this is going to have to take, as we've seen, local government isn't going to do anything. Like the state, I mean, Gavin ain't worried about it. Um, it's almost like you need a tough, strong leader, someone who's going to make this a priority because the biggest threat is what Eric just mentioned. He's like, we're seeing the beginnings of this. Like if people don't start paying attention, it's going to creep up on them. So it's literally going to have to require like a crazy task force that's going to have to go head to head with the cartel as militarized and as organized and as well funded that they are. Yeah. Um, like, we, yeah. What does this do for people that are doing it legally? Like for the growers that are trying to do this legally, like how, what, what incentive do they really have to continue to do this legally? If you could just do it illegally. I don't think there is, man. I think like, uh, there is one guy uh, in the documentary too. He's like, I'm a legal grower, but I can only have six plants. <laughs> it's like, what? Why? You know, like for him. Yeah. That's the thing, you know? And, um, I agree with a lot of the things he was saying. Well, in terms of saying like, he's like, you know, I don't, I'm not against people trying to come over here to make better money, but the state, the county, my city, you know, they're not seeing a penny from this because it's all illegal cultivation. You know, all the, um, I think it's like 80% of them, uh, weed in California is black market. What? Holy shit. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, hold on, hold on. Back up. So if I go into a dispensary, 
Oh, some of that might be black market. I think so. I think the majority of the time you're probably buying back black market weed. Dude, and if you saw how this shit's made, it's like, how could this be? Like, I don't know. What's your opinion of it, Eric? Like, is it pretty sketchy shit? Though, obviously, the way that they're making it, like whatever's being bagged and given to dispensaries or, or like even fertilizers. People. You mean like like? It's. I think it's a mix because uh, on my first day out there, and they just dump all their trash on the side of the highways and stuff, and uh, we open up a trash bag, and um, there are some some of the cartels out there just making quick weed using whatever they can get, you know, just to put a product out there. But uh, on my first day, we opened up this bag and um, it was a premium product, which is really interesting. Uh, I used to, I used to be, I used to landscape back in the day uh, in the Manhattan beach. I worked at a gardening center and what I found in the trash bag was a lot of the stuff I used to sell, mm. like bags of soil that are like $40 fertilizers that are like super, you know, specific that are like, Real, it's they're using really expensive material. I don't know which cartel it was that dump, dumps that out there, but I think in that trash bag there was probably like eight hundred dollars worth of just gardening supplies well, like that. So like some people are really really taking the um, stepping up their game to grow good weed, even though it's illegal. And I'm a lot of it is also just cheap, you know, cheap weed. Well, my concern is uh, like cancerous chemicals yeah, or, or it with shit. yeah or just or just like fucked up fertilizer or something to where now it's in my little lungs. <laughs> yeah, how and I'm thinking, fentanyl, how could <laughs> fentanyl not get in there? You know, uh, I have heard, I have heard some cases. Uh, I, I don't know how common that is. Where like, why would you put fentanyl in weed? But I have heard of someone that was like, man, I smoked some shit with some people, ended up in the hospital or something like that. But m- my concern is like, they're using cancerous chemicals that you know you shouldn't be. It's like ah, it's just gonna make it grow quicker, so we can hurt make more money. Yeah, and then. Yeah. We're over here smoking that shit. So, Eric, when they buy this shit, like, uh, I saw, like, you know, Walmart swimming pools where they'll put the fertilizer in the soil and stuff to, like, start some kind of process or to put the water in and they'll get, like, all the materials from, like, Home Depot or whatever. And then if they do do yeah. something about it and they take take it down, like, they have a task force that goes in there, right? And they try to eliminate some of these grow ops, but then they're just right back up, right? Oh, uh, yeah, man. It's like, so I guess, uh, it's like in the, the part where uh, we were on the Chinese grow. Where they did the where we find those five Asian guys, the the migrant workers there. Um, I guess they can legally only take the weed, the plants. So they go in there, they cut them up, but I guess the warrant doesn't allow for them to mess with the actual like property and the structures. So all the the greenhouses yeah. and electrical and all that stuff, they leave it there. Yeah. And there was an instance where there was a grow. I think it was my second day out there, or my third day out there with Jorge. Uh, we found a grow. I think it had like three, maybe two greenhouses. It was, it had been raided. So like all the plywood was like knocked over, like everything was taken out. And within two weeks, we went by that same grow back up and running. Just two weeks back later. Back up and running. Like it, like it never happened. It's just like, well, I love, or like they took two weeks off, you know, to go vacate or something like that. They were just back. All the plywood was back up. Um, these fools were like just chilling in their car in the back. Uh, again, it's just like if it's $500 fine, you know, why wouldn't you want to just go back and make way more money right. and just risk risk another misdemeanor? You know, it, it just for them that it only makes sense. You know what I mean? Like it's it's such a small sliver, mm-hmm. small, really minute percentage of like what what they're making in the end. I'm curious um, which cartels it is mm-hmm. that are have their tentacles across the border. And then all that cash that's generated from that those illegal grows gets shipped back. To the cartel, or somehow, some way, right? It goes in their accounts through their. Well, you can't. I mean, I, I money mean, laundering. Yeah, you'd have to, you know, clean it or whatever, because you still can't. Even in California, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. You can't deposit those large sums of cannabis money into federal. No, 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 no. That's for the legal. That's the legal law. But even, I'm, I'm talking. Yeah. No, I'm talking about they smuggle the same way they smuggle in people and drugs up north. They bring in cash and guns or whatever. Mm down south meaning yeah. let's just say hypothetically you're a cartel and let's say i don't know sinaloa sure or something or jalisco hypothetically and you got your grows and shit in california or these rural areas the money's getting funneled back in so i guess the point i'm trying to make is i don't know what the fuck my point was <laughs> but 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 <laughs> but yeah they're taking all this money back down south so so here here's what i'm trying to say um, it's almost as if like, yo, the cartel, it's almost like Ozark. It's mm-hmm. like, no, bro, 
the cartels are here already. Yes. And that's yeah. a that could be a big argument again for when it comes to these open border policies and it's like, you know, people it's nuanced and you nitpick and you know, we need to give these people 450,000 and Trump was evil orange and he's ripped the babies out of the mama's hands and it's like, okay, okay, okay. Let's put all that aside for a second. Do you want the cartels all up in your hood? Oh, of course not. Okay, well you're empowering them because these are transnational criminal organizations and they're exacerbating like Biden's open border policies. They're able to now expand into our country and it's really going to be difficult to like i mean especially the way we're headed like lawlessness chaos no law and order defund the police abolish ice open the border and it's like okay you don't know what you're doing kathy (laughs) you know what i'm saying Alyssa milano karen you have no idea that you're about to make shit out of control i guess my concern is at what point does it become like, let's just say, at what point does it become like, okay, now we really need a strong leader in, as a president, like where part of their agenda and their priority soon, it's going to be one of the top five, top 10 things. Well, we just had that, right? Border security was at the top of one well, of them. Border security. List. Yeah. But not when it starts to turn into this conversation. Hey, bro, uh, besides cost of goods, cost of living, What's up with the cartels in our cities? Or or let's just say, I, I wouldn't doubt they're in South Texas. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You have people who work for the cartel. So pretty much what's going to have to happen is we're going to need a strong leader who's going to label these folks as um, terrorist organizations. And now they're going to have to like go in probably to Mexico and say, hey, Mexico, get the fuck out the way because y'all not handling this shit. And then they're going to have to probably go in those rural areas. Whereas we've seen... As soon as you're done, they're going to pop back up. It's like, the, it's. I don't want to use the term roaches, but like sometimes <laughs> you get infested. You Sometimes you get infested with a situation, right? Let's say you have ants in your house, whatever it is, and you spray poison and you're looking for them and you're patching up holes. But then, you know, they come back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Eric, what do you think about that? And I'm, and I'm glad you said that, Chingo, um, to, to label them as terrorists, because that's literally what they are, man. This this whole, the, one of the, again, being first generation American, some of my family in Mexico, they have to deal with this shit. And that's fucking scary to learn that my, my relatives down there, even mm-hmm. this year, some of them had to leave. They couldn't even go to their house to get a suki. They're just like, no, we need to leave right now. With the clothes on our back, whatever money you got in your pocket, we need to get the fuck out. Yeah. So um, mm-hmm. it's just this 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 word game that, that our political leaders and you know people that are you know we play we put into these positions you know to like handle this shit that that really gets me man it really angers me because you know they do this semantic stuff where it's just like oh you don't want to call them that if you call them that then you know it's mean yeah. it, it, then it's mean or you know i think uh, a while back they were trying to say like not to even call the mexican cartels or like they wanted to label them something else so it's awesome. just like man like what are you guys doing like, just like just they focusing did. on the on the on the semantic it's like these guys our terrorists. Just like they did with the Taliban. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, just like they did with the Taliban, man. Uh, the, one of the guys in the documentary, um, I think he was a mayor. Uh, I think he was the mayor, but uh, Rex Paris. Uh, he was saying, like, if you if we don't stop this now, we're going to start seeing bodies suspended from the overpasses. Yeah, that was like a crazy Mexico. line. In Mexico, they'll kill they'll kill people and throw you over the bridge. Over the freeway, make an example yeah. out of and you. then with, like, with the necromanta, the signs, and it'll just basically say, "If you get in our way, this is what's going to happen." This is you. You next for the for the whole town to see. Eric, who was the guy that they were trying to recall still in California? Was that the mayor? Or was that the prosecutor? Or who was that? Uh, I think that was the mayor. I believe Mayor Gascon. Gascon, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Eric, uh, not to um, I don't want to dig up in your business, but your political views have they shifted? Uh, what are they? Have they changed throughout the years? Can you tell us about that? I guess politically, um, I wouldn't even say that they're political. For me, again, it's just a lot of this shifting, mental shifting happened to me uh, when the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. Just because, again, I just saw what was happening with with la gente, you know, with the Latino people. Just seeing like, man, like, if we're the, the, the backbone of the country, you know, across almost every industry... Like, you know, like, why, why is this happening to us? Why are we being told... Don't go outside. Oh, now you can't work. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Don't visit your family in Mexico. Gavin Newsom can have a party, but you, your daughter can't have a quinceanera. Mm. Um, what, were the street, what were the streets minute, saying? Minute. What were the streets saying when you were covering this at the beginning of the pandemic? Like, what was everything going on at the car shows or at the underground meets? And what, what, what were people saying? What were the raza on the, on the street saying? About the border? About, no, well, about the whole thing, about the lockdown, about the 15 days oh, of the slow the spread. Like, there is, and the way, like, that's what I mean. Like, also, like, uh, I, I got a lot, of, I got really inspired by, by my gente because when I would go to all, to all these parties during the lockdown, you just saw how people wanted to, like, to socialize again. You know, they, they weren't, they weren't really feeling this whole, like, oh, man, I can't hang out with my homies. I can't go see my tia. I can't go do this. I can't do that. I think a lot of us at the end of the day are going to, are probably going to side with that where you're like, you know what, whatever ele- element of risk is involved in this for me to be with my people, to participate in the culture, to expand the culture, you know, to bring people in and show them what we're all about, even though this is happening. I think like that's for us, it's, it's, it's um, it says a lot about us, you know, cause again, like we, we're going to be the, uh, a majority soon in this country so if we're gonna like take a back seat and not step up to the plate when it, you know when that time finally comes for us what what is it what are we gonna be when we're the majority but we're just like yeah i, I agree like puppets you know what i mean we're just gonna be like a majority of puppets mm-hmm. we're not gonna like i tell uh, that was a cool thing about being with all the lowrider needs you know seeing all these impalas you know the all the boards all the all the only cars and the same, like, man, if that goes away, what is what the lowrider itself and like Cholo culture, Chicano culture, if that little part goes away, that's going to be a domino effect. It's going to be okay. Right now, it's going to be no lowriders, but then there's going to be no boogies, no parties, you know? And then it's going to be, oh, you can't go to the Chicano park or any, only danzas or cultural events. It's just going to like go on and yeah, go on. Yeah, it's going to turn on. into China. <clears throat> Yeah, it's gonna go. Pretty yeah, pretty much that, man. So I just, I just again, I talked to a lot of people, and um, I remember at this one party in Santa Ana, um, I would ask people like, "Hey, man, like, so you're just, just generally asking? You know, I don't really give a shit about COVID or anything like that. I never caught it. I never got sick or anything like that. Um, I would just ask people, so you're not concerned or worried about getting it or just being in here? And they're like, "Oh, man." I'm so fucked up and I'm having such a great time right now. Why would I even think about that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and just, you can just, again, seeing like people wanting to be, I guess Latinos want is being Latinos. You know what I mean? Like wanting to be themselves, wanting to be in, engaged with the community in any, any way that they could. So from then to now, Eric, from, from the beginning of the lockdown to now, you know, a year and a half later, what are you hearing or what do you feel like the sentiment is among those same group of people? Do they like what's going uh, think, on? Do they think the direction's good? Do they feel like who's in charge is the right person to be in charge? Do they have any kind uh, of... Are they saying, vamos, brando? <laughs> yeah, like, what are they actually saying? <laughs> uh, I think more, as time goes on, man, I think, like, because like, the people like, like Jingo Bling and, like, so many other people with, like, a, a large platform, over time, people are, like, starting to tune in more hmm. into, like, people, people like us, you know, that we're trying to just maybe not be forcibly you know, drilling this into people's heads by saying, like, hey, man, this is going on and that's going to affect you before it affects the people up mm-hmm. here. That's good to hear. People that make money. You know what I mean? So, like, now people are saying, like, man, like, gas, yes. you know, I think that's one of the things where I tell people, like, it's going to get worse and it has to get worse. So people can finally see, like, hey, this is finally, or, like, now it's, I am actually feeling the repercussions of this thing. L- l- let me ask so you. Now, like, you're starting to see Oh no! Go 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 ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to interrupt you either, but um, I'm curious based on what you're saying, like people starting to kind of question things, like, okay, I know it's a scary bug, and you know it's a super flu, and it's killing people, but uh, damn, bro, we got to get rid of the backyard boogies and the fucking lowrider lifestyle. So, um, adding on to Rob's question, have you seen the sentiments change? specifically LA County, like the people that live like Boyle Heights, East Los, like you're in the city, like people that go to Hollywood, like I'm talking about LA, like you land in the LAX, like that, that world, do they see it? Because from my experience lately with my tour, I hit the outskirts. I hit like Brea, Irvine, Oxnard, Ontario, stuff like that. 
And it just reminds me of Texas. Like people are just like, hey, dude, what's up? No one's wearing a mask in the crowd. People shaking hands. Um, they kind of, we see eye to eye. But a lot of my friends that are more like L.A. County, like Huntington Park and things like that, HP, they're a little bit more like, hey, fool, it's because, you know, we can't take the mask off yet because too many people are not wearing masks. Or like we have to get jabbed because too many of y'all are not getting jabbed. And that's why we don't have our freedom yet. It's because of the non-vaxxed. It's like hella, hella talking points. Uh, have you seen? Yeah, I like, see what you mean. I, I think, yeah, like in like more like central, like actual L.A., city of L.A., I, I do see that more still. Um, like I spend a lot of time in San Diego because this is where my family is. So for us, we don't have that. We don't have the mandates like that. You know, you can go to Walmart. You can go to the library, whatever. No mask. You know, none of the none of that stuff's mandated here. None of the Vax so passport. None of the Vax passport stuff's mandated. Uh I guess, I mean, if you want to take public transport, that's when you got to mask up and all that. But that's just like one exception. Yeah. But when I go to LA, it's like I'm visiting another country. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I see. Like I remember the first time I went up there, it was this year. Um, it was been a, it had been a minute since I went to LA, and I went up to LA, and it was just people would look at me like you're fucking crazy. What if you didn't I have a mask on? Target. I, yeah, for no ma- having mm. no mask on. And again, for me, like I just live here in San Diego. When I stay here. And no one says anything. So, like, I just got used to that. So, when I go to LA and go to the store, everyone's just looking at you. And in my head, I was just like, man, I'm like, I'm not stealing anything if that's like, oh, man. Know, that was the thing in the back of my head at first. And oh, they're like, yeah. sir, do you have a mask? Uh, and I'd be like, no, like, why? And they're like, oh, well, I was like, oh, LA, I got it. Well, you know, but it, every time I go up there, it's like, it just, I kind of have to like mentally prepare, I guess, a day in advance. Just like, okay, I'm going to go to LA. If I really want to go to a store, you know, I got to bring a mask with me just in case I have to go in there, you know, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, um, I, I avoid it. Yeah, LA, LA yeah. is pretty much like the, the epicenter of all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I avoid it. Um, you can't pay me to live in L.A. right now. <laughs> uh, I probably I probably <laughs> won't be allowed in L.A. pretty soon. The way everything's going with the every Starbucks, every single yeah. place, every single business, every single little shop, cafe, restaurant you have to present your medical records um and identification it's crazy bro yeah and id yeah but not to vote it, it, i mean <laughs> i mean stupid. we all see how ridiculous this is but the propaganda is so strong between univision telemundo uh cnn and just la raza just like no pues es que mijo you know like i, I trust me bro i get into these talks with my dad uh, just my mom, just different people. I try to explain to them like ese pinche viejito lo escondieron. Yeah. You know what I mean? Lo tenían en el basement porque todo mundo se iba a dar cuenta that if they had him out there actually campaigning, they'd have been like, he ain't got the energy, he ain't got the support or the base. This is all fucking facade. Um, mm. And I caught a lot of heat just because I, you know, I basically was like, hey, I'm a vote for Trump, not Biden. And of course, that triggers people instead of like. Well, you know, some of these democratic policies, you know, maybe I could have like massaged it a little bit better. Like, well, some of these things don't really make sense. Or I have some questions. <laughs> Pero chingue su madre. I was like, I was el pinche Brandon, como que no. Um, hey, Eric, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what did you think when you first caught wind that Chingo Bling had, you know, started this kind of podcast? It was talking about, you know, political views and, and whatnot. Oh, man, that was... So I mean, like I'm, I'm at the beginning, like I wasn't, I wasn't for Trump, right? I, I was one of those Latinos, you know. Like I, I was kind of like Chingo, how he's saying, like I'm glad you brought that up. Where I was like, you know, like Camper Deporta Saul, um, you would look at anything that you would even take with the slightest hint of criticism and be like, oh, that's that's because uh, because I'm Mexican, or right. discriminating me because I'm Mexican, or my parents are Mexican. So I mean, that's how that's how I kind of grew up. That was the kind of culture I grew up in environment here in uh, Southern California. So all this stuff that happened in a way was a blessing because, you know, it just opened the doors and then, you know, you just started seeing truth for what it is. Not just like, you know, how some people go, well, you know, oh, my version of the truth. It's like, no, there is no your version of the truth. There is only one truth. Yeah. Shout out. And if you want to and if you want to walk that line, you, you got to walk the line of truth. You can't just stray from it and s- still call it a truth. Yeah. When it clearly isn't. I know Mike Pence isn't, you know, a lot of people don't like Mike Pence these days, but uh, he had that good line against Kamala where it's like, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. 
Exactly. And that's how a lot of people exactly. try to frame a lot of what's going on by their own facts, whatever their, you know, they, you know, their idea of their facts is. But uh, so to, to kind of wrap up, like with the, the, the documentary, the, talking about that, I guess, how would you describe this in, in an elevator pitch to the listeners? Like, what are they going to learn from watching this documentary? And what are they going to want to share with others when they watch this documentary? Well, I hope they learn, man, that this was something that's been a long time coming. You know what I mean? I think the cartels have just been waiting for an opportunity like this and that they knew it was going to come because the level of influence they have, not just as a criminal organization, but as like a, I guess for lack of better words, as a cultural influence. You know what I mean? You got all these taquachitos appropriating the culture, you know, singing it in all these new music. Um Shows like Narcos, which I'm sure are great for entertainment, but, you know, it's just when you're romanticizing mm-hmm. like a terrorist organization. Um, I think these criminal um, organizations just like, okay, we're just going to let this play out a little bit. People are going to get used to it. There's some stuff that people can, I guess, think is cool, like the fashion, the mamalonas, you know, the trucks and all that stuff. Like, they're using all that stuff. Like, I think they, they're all, again, social media. If you follow, Social media, they love social media. I mean, they're again, they're so blatant about everything they do. They go on Twitter and just post pictures of dead bodies, their money, their weapons. I think that's he's like the bitches. Don't realize that, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I tell people this is like la six nine, like, like, like <laughs> we're in a, right now in this state in uh, the country, it's like what gangster rap was in the 90s, you know what I mean? Where it was just like it sounds good, the music's badass, and all that, but. Listen to what they're saying. And then, like, who they're involved with. And then what those people do. And then, you know, it's the same thing you now happening. You know, like, yeah, the music, you know, you hear the rancheras and the norteños. It sounds good. It's good in your music, you know? It's upbeat and all that. But then you tell people that don't speak Spanish, the chorus in this song goes as such. You know, I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to move these drugs. And I'm going to do this and this and this. And then they're like, oh, wow. Like, that's. That's really what he's singing about. It's like, yeah, it's literally what he's singing about. Um, I think that this is like the next, the evolution of that. What happened in the 90s with rap. Um, and so I hope people can kind of like take some of that away where it's just like, and the criminal organization is essentially a business because they're running it that way. They got to make their money because they know they can make it where, where they can make it despite of even though it may be illegal, again, they're just using all these things to their advantage. They got people working with them on our side. Um, I hope that the open border people realize what they're popping up with this stuff. Because I tell people, if you're open borders, you're pro this. If you're open borders, you are pro child abuse. You are pro child trafficking, sex trafficking, human slavery. Um, National security. It, national security wages you're economy wage and you're, yeah like another thing i tell especially with the latino people with the raza i'm like all this stuff that happens that affects us first you know like all these people on the border towns which you know predominantly are still like mexican like they they complain they're like the first to complain they're like hey man these people are like i find them in my house i find them in my ranchito you know i, I found a goat that was killed you know like they're just going around stealing, you know, like. Uh, well, the Rio Grande Valley speaking up. Yeah, they're, they're showing. Yeah, it with they're speaking out. Like, I was, I was, that was an amazing um, experience for me. Just again, one of those eye-opening moments where it's just like, man, like the people I hear first are my people. They're the first ones. Like they're the ones in the the, the canary in the coal mine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I want, I want everyone to know. But for me, the the thing is about I got tired of seeing you know our gente being so misinformed. And just when you went with Anthony, cool. was that the For first time? Was that the first time you went to the border here in Texas? With An- with Anthony, yeah. Yeah. What what, what was your big takeaway? Because I know Chingo also also went last last year, but or this year, uh, yeah, earlier this year. Was it? Yeah, Fuck, yeah. I can't even remember. Uh, what was your what what were the one of the big one of the big things that you took away from that, and and maybe didn't expect or didn't think was real or didn't think it was that to that degree? Um. I guess the the, mo- the eye opening thing for me was really like uh, just seeing the kids. Yeah. Um, like I mean, I knew that was real, but again, this is one of those things. It was one of those th- moments where I was just like, "Wow, finally!" Because of all this stuff going on, like I saw that. How many um, days did y'all cover the border? 
first time, I think I was there for like maybe nine days. And then the second time I went, I was there for like three weeks. Oh, straight. damn. Um, mm. The second time I went there, I was in Del Rio. And uh, I wanted to be there as close as I could, you know, um, as fast as I could. So I got a rental and I slept. In, I was like, I pulled a Chris Farley. I slept <laughs> in my car right next to the fucking river. <laughs> And then Chris real. Farley. Wow. So I would wake up. Oh, yeah. every Down, day you're living in a van just, <laughs> down by the river. I, I I would wake up every two hours and there would just be people there that I just crossed. And so I'd wake up, get out the car, take some pictures, go back in the car, take another two hour nap, wake up, more people. It didn't. It was just like that that um that often it happens down there. Just every hour there's just people coming over. Um but yeah, I mean, I get for me, it was the kids, man. It was just like, I don't know. That's again, it's like one of those things that just burned into my mind. Uh, where this one kid in particular, this eight year old kid from Honduras, a little boy, uh, his name was Hector. I got to talk to him, but he was just, he was exhausted, man. He was um, laying down on the grass on this park in La Jolla, where that's right adjacent to the border, just with his hands up like that. He was, dirty as hell i mean he looked like he crawled out of a dumpster you know it was just a depressing mm, mm. sight just to see a little kid like that and i would tell him in spanish like ¿Dónde está? ¿Dónde eres, mijo? like ¿Está todo bien? And he was like yeah yeah he was just really you know, with his voice like super tired and i was like did anything happen to you did anyone hurt you and he's like no nothing like that happened and i was like why are you here alone and he's like well when i was in honduras my tia was the one taking care of me but she wanted to go live in spain so she paid for me for to have me sent up here so I could have a, a better life so that she can go start a new one in Spain. Wow. Man, that's an eight year old little boy, man. He told eight. me that to my face. Holy eight, eight, shit. Eight year old boy, man. So like I said, I, he taught me like every night after that stuff, when we would we, uh, me and the boys would go back to the motel, I would just cry like a bitch in the shower. Because I've never seen, heard, experienced anything like that. Ever. Ever bro, in my life. Bro, I have kids, bro. Yeah. I can't picture, uh, I mean, psh, my 13-year-old, she she barely could handle, like, hey, Mika, go get the milk. Like, I'm going to go grab the, t- <laughs> I'm going to grab the, 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 the soap detergent, go get the milk, I'll meet you by the granola. She'd be like, oh, my God, where's that? Or <laughs> hey, something. Way to diffuse a heavy moment. Way to, uh, I like it. Get I mean, it. dude, it's so fucking I tough. Mean, I, I have a three-year-old. Yeah. I can't picture her, like, five years from now, by herself, sleeping in a park, you know what traveling I mean? how far with who and then what is the okay. protocol let's just say hypothetically there's a um somebody from tamaulipas right northern mexico and they see an eight-year-old boy from honduras lost looking asking which way's north like what's the protocol do you say hey kid let me call like what do you do do you just say hey good luck give him a backpack full of snacks and say on your way i feel like that is the protocol jesus christ Hey, what? Because in Mexico, they don't, they don't want them to stay there. No, of course. So, like, you see all the people that you see going, like, hey, hey, andale, andale, vayan, vayan. They're just like, okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah, don't stay don't here. Want, yeah, get out of our hair. Don't stay here, man. They're like, we have our own problems. <laughs> yeah. Eric, what yeah, was one exactly. of the big takeaways from the Border Patrol and all the time that you were there? Like, without having to give too many details, like, what were some of the sentiments from them as far as, like, what was going on and how they were handling it? Uh, it was, I mean, I, I, I saw a bunch of different people every single day. Uh, uh, I guess they're doing what they can, man. Like, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, you have this chain of command. And if you're working down on the border, you're usually just following your orders. Um, but it was just, it's interesting for me and eye opening again because um, in Roma, Texas, we went down uh, on the, right on the riverbank. Um, we were watching people, the coyotes, cross people by raft with inflatable rafts that you can get at Costco or like, you know, like a Coleman raft. So these guys, the Coyotes would still like stuff like eight to 12 people in one of these like little rafts, bring them over. And we're like three feet away from National Guard and Border Patrol, like almost shoulder to shoulder. And they just watched this happen. There isn't like, hey, no, turn around. I mean, they started doing that with when the Haitians were like- With the horses. The sound, you know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that's when but, they were like, Democrats were like, this is our chance. It looks like whips. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> move in. Move in. Pobrecito los Haitians. I know, huh? Um, that was weird for me because, like, in my head, I was just like, you're not doing your job. You're 
not patrolling the border. You're just, you're just processing. People. Um, you're just watching them come up. There was a, while I was there, uh, a raft came up and the national guard actually helps the people off the raft. Yeah. That's so when I saw that, yeah. I was just like, Damn. what do you like? Is this like a joke or something or like, is it was just a welcome. Like in my head, yeah. it, it was like a welcome. I mean, they, welcoming center. Yeah. They're, they're just brought over even by um, the people that we put in charge to patrol it over there. They're just told like, Hey, yeah, come on. I'll help you. Come on. Walk yeah. up with us. We'll take you up here. You'll get processed, put on a bus, mm-hmm. put on a taken in the facility for like a few weeks and then get, you a get check. your ticket to get a check. Or if you, or if you're a kid, no, uh, I guess the sponsor, someone that can sponsor you doesn't have to be vetted. So you can be an undocumented person, be a sponsor, get one of these kids and who knows what the hell's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's, there's been some sponsors that have turned out to be uh, child abusers. Oh, tons of them. Yeah. So you have these, uh, these non- kids are just getting handed over to like pedos. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have the NGOs. You have the Catholic Church involved. You, uh, the yeah. globalists. The globalists are loving this because they're weaponizing um, migrants. They did it to Germany, I think, in 2014, 2015 or something. But it then they start to drop off people, fly them out, bust them out in the middle of the night to East Tennessee, to like upstate New York, just dropping them off everywhere to where every county becomes a border town. And the people starting to notice, like New York posted a story where it's like Biden's secret flights, mm-hmm. you know, dropping off kids. And then they asked Jen Psaki, they're like, it, can you tell us more about you know the biden the brand administration dumping off kids in these upstate new york random counties at three in the morning late at night she's like um that's actually early in the morning not late at night and she's like next question and <laughs> oh it's like God. it's like damn you just think it's a joke you just hop on tv and lie to our face and people have grievances people from that's why all these counties in south texas flip uh flip red because like you said, they're the first line, they're the front line, they're the canary in the coal mine, and they feel it first, the impact of the, you know, whether it's the wages or people breaking into their ranchitos and tearing shit up. I met a gentleman, he had some land in, um, was it Eagle Pass? Do you remember when I told this story? Yes, I think I it was. I think it was Eagle Pass or Del Rio. And he was like, he's like, yeah, I got to go check up on my property. He's like, I have cameras. He's like, I set up free water for them so that they don't go tearing up my little shack where I have some other pipe plumbing type stuff. So I leave the cases over there and he's like, I'm having to accommodate them. Um, He's like, the federal government doesn't reimburse me when I have to go repair fencing. And he's like, he said, he said a girl, a young girl died on my property of dehydration as these groups are moving in. They just left her there. He's like, now I got these forensic people and all these government, whoever police and stuff. Now my shit's a fucking crime scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ain't that a bitch? Yeah, I, Eric, I'll leave you with this because I feel like what you guys did with this doc is is really good. It, it's sharing a lot of information. It's opening people's minds, you know, just kind of slowly dripping out this info. And I think I was telling my wife last night, over the next three years, between now, and I hate to make, you know, national elections this big, big deal because it is, but not to everybody. But I think to more people, it is going to be a big deal in three years. And this is one of those issues that is going to really be highlighted between now and 2024 if the right people are putting the right info out there. So many issues. Yeah. Education, mandates, freedom, economy. <sighs> I know, man. It's just, it's como dije, you know, I think it's going to have to get worse for people yeah, to realize. For sure. The, uh, like a notable percentage to finally see, okay, you know what? Now, now I can't, now I got to say something. Yeah. You know, I did. I let 100,000 migrants into my city. I could do that. We gave them money, free schooling. I could do that. But whatever comes after that, that people aren't. Um, I guess it's just going to be like a what shit hits the fan moment for them. Yeah, like that's where they're going to be like, okay, you know what? Let's all get it together now. I see what you were saying. Yeah, and well, hopefully, man, hopefully sooner than later. But I know something is going to happen. It's I don't a marathon. Know what it's, gonna be, it's a marathon. But I, it's going to something's going to happen, and people are finally going to be like, okay, shit. I feel. I feel now like we actually got to do something. I feel like a lot of Latinos don't put two and two together. They might sit there and be like, dang, now I got to, uh, my, my job's going to fire me if I don't get the jab. I got to show this little passport thing everywhere. It's just a QR code, uh, you know, shut down for a little bit. And, and they don't equate like, for example, like, huh, why is Texas and Florida so free? Why are these red states so free? And why are these Gavin Newsom and Mayor Garcetti are fucking tyranny? You know, these little tyrants. Mm-hmm. And, they don't put two and two together. All they know is Florida, DeSantis, 
He's ruining Florida. Why do you say that? He's killing people. What do you mean by that? <sighs> COVID? And it's like, everyone doesn't have COVID? I mean, there's not COVID cases everywhere? Because Brandon, he ran on this idea that he was going to be able to contain this virus and handle it better than everyone else. And as we see, motherfucker can't even handle his bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I got this deal. He lived, he moved out before all this pandemic just started. He he moved his family out to uh, Fort Worth some years ago. And when I got to go visit him, uh, yeah, I think it was like three, four years ago. Uh, cool, I, I love him. He's one of my favorite deals. I was like, Leo, like, why why'd you move to Texas? You know, like you moved to San Diego when you first came up. Your whole all your kids are from there. And he just looks at me in the face, man. He looks like the Pringles man. It's like he just be what they. He's just like, a bunch of fucking losers, Nico. <laughs> Everyone in California is a fucking loser. And I was like, damn, okay, okay. Freedom, Nico. Uh, <laughs> Love you too, Theo. He, he loves it out there, man. He loves Texas. I, I've never seen him that happy. Just like He's thriving out there. He, he's thriving out there, yeah. He's, I guess, getting close to retirement age. He looks better. He just, I, you know, people like that also, like in my life also, we're just saying like, there's just something happening. And like, you know, with my own family, like with my tío, as I just told you, you know, it's just like, man, like something's, ha something's happening, something's up. If my tío, who had his whole life down here, just said, fuck it, I'm going to take everything I have and go all the way over there. Because yeah. I know it's going to be better for me. When, when all our tíos start to be on some America first shit and like, hey, man, we need to like <laughs> fix our economy, close the border. Oh, man, the, the left wing media is going to, Alyssa Milano is going to tweet like these fucking insurrection brown brown domestic whatever um you know it's like unfortunately the propaganda and the media have labeled anyone who's on some like america first you know make it great again type of shit uh freedom yeah. or they're against or they're hesitant for the jab or they're against mandates it's like you fucking fucking horse paste eating motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> that's how they look at me they look at me like i'm crazy uh eric what's next know, man Hey, what's next for what's you? Next for uh, yeah, project wise, what do you got working on, or maybe with Jorge, or just you alone? Uh, not sure. What's, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be doing some work with Jorge again. Um, just a lot of stuffs happening here in California, you know, just with the mandate stuff. So there's always something popping up over here. Um, I got a an art show coming up in Orange County, and it's going to be with some of my work that I did at the border. Uh, some of the stuff I did with the here with the Latin community during the pandemic when everyone was just partying. I want to shine a light on what life was like for us for this past year and a half, not going on the two years. Cause I think a lot of people, you know, more, more times than none, they see, I guess they see the Latino people, not just Latinos, but minorities across the board, just more docile, you know, like, Oh, like they're, they're going to listen to us. We're just going to throw us out there and they're going to, they're going to buy it. But I want them to see that, what they're not seeing or what's being censored on TV and mainstream media or social media. I want to see like, you know what, what you guys were out there doing your BLM Antifa shit or, you know, trying to open the border. This is what Latinos are actually doing. Mm, right. They were trying to live their life. They were trying to just be human. Humans trying to be human still. They, they weren't about that. And, you know, this is an important part of our history as Mexican Americans, Latino Americans, and just American history in general that shouldn't be just swept under the rug. Yeah, you might have to do a photo book. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. I'm trying to work on that, too. I've just, I got a lot of photos, man, and I just want to curate it well. I just make sure I got something solid so I can put something physical up there. Cool, nice. man. Well, where can everybody follow you and give them the link to the um, documentary one more time? So everyone can follow me at Duvalin Papi 2.0 across social or on Instagram. On Twitter, it's just Duvalin Papi. Um, if you guys want to watch the cartel, documentary it's called cartelville usa and you can go to carteldoc.com and thank you guys for your support for the encouragement and i hope we can keep putting more work out there so everyone can stay conscious of what's happening here in america Orale. so you're still in the san diego area yeah i stay in san diego mostly. okay awesome man so um i believe i'll be out there doing a show hopefully you're around we'd love to have you as a special guest and if you're ever in texas uh, campaigning a book or a documentary or anything please reach out uh, we would love to be a, an asset and help and spread the word and and so you can sell it out and and just reach more people Orale, man. Ahí estamos. Muchas gracias. A huevo. thank you eric have a good we, one brother we appreciate you man thank you brother keep up the great appreciate work you keep up the great work gracias, hermano. Gracias. Sure. you too man thank for you for sure. being out here for everyone a huevo. A wee -wee. abuelita de batman <laughs>
<laughs> See ya. Peace.